so hello children i guess the upsc exams were uh, easy for you and most of them most of the uh, questions were already discussed in the class so we will just discuss the uh, questions with the relevant explanation uh, let's start with um, upsc 2023 questions so first question is carbohydrate metabolism in normal pregnancy shows so here the confusing thing is normal pregnancy normal pregnancy itself is diabetogenic which means normal in uh, whatever is seen in diabetes whatever we discussed in diabetes applies to normal pregnancy also so here it is given as fasting hypoglycemia and postprandial hypoglycemia so this is the first point that i discussed in class when i was discussing diabetes in pregnancy so in pregnancy it is always fasting hypoglycemia and postprandial hyperglycemia right even in normal pregnancy this is happening because pregnancy itself is a diabetogenic state which means there is fasting hypoglycemia and postprandial hyperglycemia right and there is here we have to select the right response right so the next thing is there is increased sensitivity to insulin receptors there is in, uh, increased resistance to insulin right no the sensitivity is decreasing only the resistance is increasing so this is again wrong so the second option is wrong and in third option is again wrong now there is decreased plasma glucose i mean glucagon that is also wrong it is only increasing so the only right thing here is fasting hypoglycemia fasting hypoglycemia yes it is present in pregnancy normal pregnancy normal pregnancy because it is diabetogenic state right now coming to the next question so the next question is the daily requirement of iron during pregnancy so iron is uh, the generally in the requirement is around 6 mg right so this is for all trimesters if we see trimester wise the first trimester requires up to 2 mg iron right and then it increases to 4 to 6 so the better option here is b 6 mg per day so here i have given you trimester wise requirement of iron so entire <coughs> pregnancy the daily requirement is 4 to 6 mg per day so that is why the government is a uh, we have to supplement 60 mg iron because only 10% of the iron that we in, that we take is absorbed by the body so if we take 60 mg iron only 6 mg will be absorbed by the body that is why we take 60 mg right uh, so trimester wise for the first two, two trimesters there is no need for extra supplementation the requirement is 1 to 2 mg per day and in five there will be vomiting and uh, the patient will be feeling nauseous so if we uh, give iron it it uh, you know it um, increases acidity it has a chance of increasing the nausea so we started from second trimester minimum of 180 days before delivery and 180 days after delivery after delivery so this is the minimum duration for which we supplement iron to the pregnant lady right so the prior trimester wise requirement is in the first trimester it is 1 to 2 mg per day and then in second trimester it is 4 to 5 and in the third trimester it is 6 mg per day in general second trimester it is 6 mg per day you can remember right now coming to a typical case of iron deficiency and anemia in pregnancy shows which of the following here if you could use your common sense you could find the answer right hemoglobin less than 10 mg percent right pcg pascal or hematocrit which is less than 30 percent right so whenever hemoglobin is less than 10 pcg is obviously less than 30 and uh, mchc is more than 30 percent right so it is never more than 30% because uh, you know the normal value of mchc is 32 plus or minus 2 so if it is more than 32 which means the uh, mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration is increased that is getting decreased in iron deficiency anemia right hemoglobin concentration is getting decreased because there is a uh, limited supply of iron and iron is the basic constituent of hemoglobin 
So there is decrease in MCHC, and here it is never more than 30%. So this is wrong. And then microcytic hypochromic picture, that is correct, right? In anemia, the cell size is also decreased, and the color, the red color of the RBC is also getting decreased. So microcytic hypochromic picture on peripheral uh, smear is correct. So what is the option that we select? We have to select an option which does not contain three, right? So it is one, two, and Next question is: What uh, which of the following clinical feature? Which of the following is a clinical feature of molar pregnancy? So in molar pregnancy, there will be a history of amenorrhea. Very good, correct. And then the patient might present to us with bleeding. If we are not noticing a molar pregnancy by early trimester scanning, the patient might come to us with a bleeding history, right? So this is correct. And then patient has excessive vomiting. What is vomiting in pregnancy due to? It is due to beta HCG. So what happens in molar pregnancy? Here they have not given whether it is complete mole or partial mole. In general, molar pregnancy, the beta HCG levels are increased and therefore vomiting or nausea is also increased. And then expulsion of grape-like vesicles. It may be there because in here they have not specified whether it is molar or a complete or partial. So grape-like vesicles may be also there. So all the three are correct. So we will select one, two, and three. Now coming to which of the following vaccines are given to pregnant women? So in pregnancy, all your vaccines can be given except live vaccines. So live vaccines are live vaccines are contraindicated right no live vaccines in pregnancy so covid vaccine can be given yes we all know in our hospital we gave covid vaccine and then mmr mmr please remember we should never never give mmr in pregnancy mmr if you have to give the break i mean if the patient is uh, if you are screening for uh, rubella and then you are finding her um, you are uh, finding her non-infected. That is, uh, she is, she has not contaminated the infection so far. So you are giving us a MMR. If you are planning to give MMR, you have to give it one year before conception. That is, if they are uh, trying or uh, planning for pregnancy, we are supposed to give MMR one year before uh, conception. So this is never given in pregnancy because this is a live vaccine. And then hepatitis B is absolutely safe in pregnancy. Rabies vaccine. Rabies is a life-threatening condition and it is always... Uh, advisable to provide rabies vaccine if the patient is uh, exposed to rabies virus okay so here the correct code will be we don't have we uh, will not give measles mumps and rubella that is option two, uh, two is omitted so the answer must be one three and four right so here i have a list of vaccines so i will give you these slides or you can copy it down also so all live vaccines are contraindicated in pregnancy and killed vaccines can be safely given. So what are the uh, safe vaccines that are given in pregnancy? Uh, the one vaccine which is routinely given to all pregnant women is influenza, right? I mean, uh, in, uh, sorry, it's not influenza. Tetanus toxoid, right? TT. And then uh, rabies vaccine, as I told you, uh, it can be given. And influenza can be given. It is not routinely given, but it, it can be given. Hepatitis A can be given. Tetanus toxoid is routinely given to all pregnant women in a, uh, I mean, the first dose and the second dose in a gap of four weeks in between, right? And the vaccines that can be given in special circumstances, which means there is suddenly an epidemic and the lady is pregnant, then we can give them inactive typhoid vaccines, pneumococcus, meningococcus, and cholera vaccines. These are given only in case if there is an epidemic that is going on, right? And the vaccines that are given when the patient is traveling to an endemic zone are uh, yellow fever and inactivated polio vaccine. So what are the vaccines that are absolutely contraindicated? This we have, if we, if you remember, we learned about HPV. What are the contraindications of HPV? One is pregnancy. So in pregnancy, HPV is never given. Zoster is never given. All virus related to zoster, uh, smallpox, chickenpox not given, MMR not given, BCG cannot be given. So all live vaccines are absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy. Please remember. Now coming to which of the following are the characters of true labor pains. So in true labor pain, what happens is um, the, uh, the intensity, the pain intensity is increasing with time, right? So intensity and duration of contraction increases progressively. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. So 
the progressive effacement and dilatation of cervix is happening that is also right cervix is showing some change it is getting effaced and it is getting dilated right and there is formation of bag of waters yes right because uh, the bag of waters it get uh, the amniotic fluid collects and it forms bag of waters and it can uh, form and it can present as bag of four waters that is true pain is confined to lower abdomen and groin pain is not just confined to lower abdomen and groin it can radiate to back radiates to back and thigh right so all these changes are typically associated with true labor pain except lower abdominal pain because lower abdominal pain can be seen in false contra false labor pain and true labor pain but in true labor pain it is associated with what lower back pain and thigh pain right so it gets radiated and uh, that is a indicator so here uh, the correct option will be 1 2 and 3 Now coming to A A M P S L. So A M P S L, we all know ten ten uh, units of uh, oxytocin I M within one minute of delivery of the baby. That is true, very correct. And then control cord traction. Yes, that is correct. We do modified Brand Andrew method. So then that is also correct. And then delayed cord clamping as per indication, very correct, right? We are we are supposed to give delayed cord clamping. And the one more point is intermittent. intermittent uterine tone assessment so remember uterine massage is not a component of ampsl that is an uh, that was an update so uh, intermittent tone assessment can be done which means we are assessing the uterus we are assessing whether it is contracted or not but in a routine massage is not a part of ampsl it is not a component of a AMPSL. So uh, these are the four points. So which is wrong here? Injection of oxytocin ten units I am at the birth of first twin. It is never given. Only after the birth of two. If if it is a twin, only after the birth of two babies, they are supposed to give oxytocin. So this is wrong. So what is the answer here? We will leave two. So it is one, three, and four. So AMPSL. Remember, it is very important. This we have discussed in our class also. While we were while we were preparing for UPSC, I've told you in class also. So um, which of the following are correct regarding acute mastitis? So mastitis is a uh, acute infection of breast parenchyma, right? Breast parenchyma is getting infected. this is happening in the first 2 to 4 weeks of pregnancy i mean postpartum yes that is correct and then microscopic examination of breast milk can show leukocyte count more than 10 to the power 6 per liter and bacterial count more than 10 to the power 3 per liter so that is also correct if it is less than i mean uh, breast milk actually contains leukocyte even in the absence of infection and uh, milk during even milk stasis can lead an increased amount increased quantity of leukocyte and bacterial count in abscess in mastitis is typically more than 10 to the power 3 per liter right but even if the bacterial count is more than 10 to the power 3 there are enough uh, uh, leukocytes in the breast milk itself so it can uh, uh, e uh, breastfeeding can be allowed even if the mother is suffering from mastitis right so this is also true okay and then the source of infection is infant nose and throat that is right Yes, the uh, usual source of infection is infant's nose and throat. And what is this organism that is causing mastitis? Acute mastitis is Staph aureus. Staph aureus is the most important organism to cause acute mastitis. Then comes your Staph albus. And rarely E. coli. These are the two main organisms. Sometimes E. coli. and other organisms might be also causing but uh, you know uh, staph aureus and albus are the most notorious organisms that are prone to cause a breast uh, i mean mastitis so here the organisms given are bacteroids e coli klebsiella which are not no, not known to cause except very rarely e coli so this is wrong option so here the answer is except 3 so 1 2 and 4 will be our answer right